Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back from Hawaii, and it is the 10th anniversary of the release of Kerbal Space Program, a game which, well, if you've watched me, you probably know about, but if you don't, before I talked about real rockets all the time, I kind of started playing video games with video game rockets, and Kerbal Space Program was the game that kind of put me out there. Um, basically gave me an audience that actually made me interested in talking about these things. So, Kerbal Space Program was originally released on June 24th, 2011. That was just you know, less than a month, I think, before the final launch of the Space Shuttle. The very earliest alpha release was version 0.73, and it had these little green men, which turned out to be a great selling factor. I know, like... The physics is great, the rocket science is fantastic, but having three little green men in the bottom right corner of your screen screaming whenever anything explodes really made it stick with a lot more gamers. The version that we have here has a very simple space center. The only thing you can click on is the vehicle assembly building. This is, after all, an alpha release. You're six months after they first developed, they started developing the game. So you have a very familiar looking screen here, a lot of the same icons, you know, you can click on your various parts. Uh, it, interestingly, they have decals, which didn't actually turn up in the game until about a year ago. But you have uh, a little um, command pod there and you can start assembling bits on it. So we'll put a stack decoupler under there, put ourselves a little rocket engine. And uh, underneath that, well, we probably need to move the whole thing upward. Well, at least that works. There's a lot of stuff in this that you expect to work if you've played the game, uh, <laughs> which doesn't actually work because it wasn't implemented. Let's uh, just put a solid, no, let's actually, let's put an FLT 500 in here. Now you'll notice I'm doing one tank here and not multiple tanks. The reason is, Back in this very earliest version, only one tank could feed one engine, so you couldn't stack tanks the way that we do, the way that we're all used to these days. Let's, uh, yeah, let's do this, and we'll do another tank, and we'll also try to put some radial boosters on, right? So, radial decouplers are things you attach to the side, and in this version, there's no symmetry, you just have to sort of guess where it is, and slap them on there and hope that they are lined up sufficiently well that they don't actually spin you off and cause you to fall over. There are also little uh, fins there, but those don't actually work as control surfaces. They don't move, they don't actuate. Uh, and again, of course, you have to worry about symmetry. No aerodynamic nose cone because, well, the aerodynamics in this game are very primitive at this time. So I, I can actually adjust the staging here, which is great. Uh, one thing I haven't put on is the parachute, and you'll notice in the description that it still has that comedic outlook on life. Widely accepted as a better alternative to being in free fall. Okay, I'm gonna see if this thing actually flies. It probably won't. It could well crash. And so here we are on the launch pad, and you'll notice, by the way, if you're a regular player, that we have this massive launch tower here. That was in all the early versions. It was eventually removed because players began building rockets so large that they would just clip through that tower and explode on spawning. Now, uh, I, I remember actually an early version where one of the things I did was lift off and try to land on top of that. So the landscape is still procedurally generated, although you'll notice there's a lot of like jiggle as the terrain re-renders at different detail levels. Obviously that got improved a whole lot. But yeah, um, look at those boosters on the outside straining against their radial mounts. That soft joint physics was very much core to the Kerbal design. In fact, I think the very first internal build of Kerbal Space Program had the boosters fly up for a couple of seconds and then shear off due to excess stress. Uh, you'll notice that we do actually have fuel gauges for the solid rocket boosters, not for the regular engine. We have no idea what's going on. Also, one of the sort of original game design features was supposed to be flying as high as possible before your rocket overheated. 
that kind of had stopped being a thing until now, and it would be a long time before thermal control became a core part of the game that had been properly designed. But yeah, look, we stage those off and they drop back to Earth to land on some Kerbal villagers, except that, of course, in this version of Kerbal Space Program, there were no villages or cities anywhere else on the planet. And indeed, in the most recent version, there are no other cities or villages anywhere else on the planet. At this point, the planet didn't have a name. Many people called it Kerth, after with a K, uh, but ultimately it would become known as Kerbin. Anyway, this early alpha of Kerbal Space Program was downloaded 5,000 times and played by people like me, uh, and it basically got itself a following. Very quickly it was developed, it would be several years before they released the 1.0 version, but there was always things to do in it and always things to learn. Still, there's lots of fun stuff to see in this early version. First of all, you'll notice the camera is shaking around. That's an early version of the Kraken, where floating point math leads to all sorts of problems with noise and forces. The texture on the base of this command pod is a car wheel. You can actually see the inflation valve in one of these. It's, it's kind of hilarious. The parachute design is practically the same as it is in the current version today. Now that capsule disappeared from the game because they, when they added Kerbals as characters that could walk around they had to rescale all the parts and that turned out to be too small. But the capsule still exists in the game if you know where to look. So this is actually the brand new version which was just released earlier this week. The main thing that adds are firework launchers because it's the 10th anniversary. They add some new textures for some of the older planets. There's a few other items in here. The save and load manager is completely redesigned, which is great because you, you know, you play the game for a long time, you end up with a lot of different spacecraft. Uh, but this is one that is downloaded from Steam. So yeah, you can head out off the runway towards the vehicle assembly building, right, which is the big building in the middle of that massively redesigned space center, right? And just in front of it, to the right of that little spherical tank, there is a monument, a monument to the original Mark I pod hewn out of solid stone, which probably doesn't help with water recovery. And a couple of hundred kilometers north of the desert launch site, there is a small hidden valley, and inside that there is the old version of the launch site. Although the graphics have been upgraded just a little bit to, you know, uh, bring them up to date with the rest of the game. But now in the new release, there are a number of other launch sites which have been added around Kerbin. And these are sort of Easter eggs that you have to find. And of course, thankfully, there's some mods to let, uh, help you out with this. So this is one that's actually pretty near to the launch site. You fly up to it and you get this message at the top telling you you have unlocked it in the game. The great thing about this one, which is just north of the launch site, is that it has a ramp that goes into the water. Finally, in, well, the final major release of the game, we get official support for boats. You don't have to fly them out to sea and drop them in the water anymore. You can just slide them down a slipway and, you know, make them look like real ships. There are a few other Easter eggs that have been added in the final release. Here's one that was made on Kerbin by Kerbals. And uh, here's me having a bit of an oopsie with opportunity. But beyond the Easter eggs and the fireworks, there is some actual gameplay changes which are really good, especially for new players. So there's something called the Maneuver Tool, and the Maneuver Tool is here to help you plot courses to planets and the moons and everything. So you select your target, it does some com computation, and you can create a node. So if I want to go to the asteroid in the middle of the asteroid belt called Drez, it's done the math, it told me that the next maneuver is in 116 days, it'll take 1.5 kilometers per second of delta V to escape, and 1.75 to arrive. So I create it, and look, it's gone and created that for me, it's created a node, and I can actually run a countdown to that and perform the maneuver. It will also create an alarm clock, a scheduling system, so that if you have other missions doing other things, it will remind you when you have maneuvers that you need to do. So this is, these are features that have been in mods for a long time, but it's nice to see them in the core game. 
Of course, the game is still entirely manual controlled. There's no autopilot. This is just telling you when to fire your engines and what direction to fire them in. And even then, it still doesn't work for a lot of maneuvers. These are just for basic transfer maneuvers from circular orbits around one planet to a circular orbit on another. If you're in deep space, then you might not be able to use it. And the latest release brings a few new parts. In the very first release of Kerbal Space Program, there were 11 different parts. Now there's over 400. This release brings four new types of solar panels. These are some of them. Uh, there's the circular design on solar panels. So you have basically four types of solar panels are now added. And the docking ports have been completely redesigned and they now feature the ability to provide some inline rotation to make sure your parts align correctly. One item, though, that didn't make it into release was the Stampotron ground anchor. People wanted ways to anchor their hardware onto a planet's surface. They had all sorts of cool ideas for it. Unfortunately, during testing, it was found that it kept on coming unstuck. And so that means that the final release of Kerbal Space Program isn't actually the final release. There's definitely going to be a 1.12.1 release at some point in the future, and that will fix a few things. It will probably add a few other bits and pieces that were missed. And you know what? You might be wondering what happens to the team behind Kerbal Space Program, what they're going to be doing from now on. Well, they're going to be working on Kerbal Space Program 2. There is another team that has been working on that game for several years, but it has had its release date pushed back by two years. And frankly, I'm okay with that because I prefer them to deliver a product which captures everything that is great about Kerbal Space Program. Now, I could go on and on about how important Kerbal Space Program has been, how it's such a you know, powerful educational tool, how it has inspired many people, but I'm just one person. And over at the official channel, they've actually got a mini documentary called The Kerbal Effect that interviews people from NASA, European Space Agency, amateur rocketry, rocketry uh, aficionados, the CEO of the United Launch Alliance, Basically, people who are absolutely qualified talk about space and rocket science because that is their job. And for Kerbal Space Program, we've had 10 amazing years of development and updates, but I don't think the story ends here. Well, first of all, there is one more update coming at least. And I think now that we're seeing a fixed version to, uh, to you know to work against the mod developers will finally update all their mods and we will have a glorious future of, of Kerbal Space Program forever I'm Scott Manley fly safe <laughs>